In 2011, 22-year-old Jared Loeffner would embark on a swift and brutal rampage that would make world headlines. Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords was among those shot. Men. All of a sudden, I heard a bang. Women. There was multiple people shot. And children. Oh, my God. Would die at his hand. As the seconds ticked, the body count rose. It was just an eerie scene of people dead, taking their last breaths. And with it, the question, what had driven this youth from the Arizona suburbs to commit his deadly killing spree? This is my genocide school. <laughs> January 2011, Tucson, Arizona. A thriving city set amidst an arid landscape in the southwestern corner of the United States. In a downtown shopping mall, recently re-elected Senator Gabrielle Giffords was about to begin a session of Congress on Your Corner, an opportunity for a meet and greet with the local residents. Gabby is my congresswoman, and um, she liked to make herself available to her constituents. People didn't have to come to her office. She would announce where she was going to be and invite people to come and talk with her. Many had been looking forward to the morning, and with an air of anticipation, a crowd gathered for the 10 a.m. start. It was a beautiful, crisp, clear, bright blue sky Saturday morning and we went out to uh, the Safeway just to pick up a couple of small items. I pulled into the parking lot and I could see the big sign up there that said Gabby Giffords. Everybody seemed to be pleasant, enjoying talking to each other. I was enjoying eavesdropping. Spirits were high, but unknown to those gathered, a danger lurked amongst them. There were 12 chairs sitting in front with 12 people, mostly couples, sitting in those chairs. So I walked to the end of the 12 chairs. But just moments in, and the lives of those waiting in line were suddenly torn apart. Within seconds of us walking into the store, that the pops started. I was standing there talking to this couple, and all of a sudden I heard a bang. And then a series of pop, 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 pop. Bang, 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 just like that. People started running into the Safeway, bloodied, screaming. They've shot the Congresswoman, they've shot the Congresswoman. I could see the shadow of the gunman walking down the sidewalk. And at point blank range, he was shooting everybody in the head. Pop, 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 pop. And when I dropped to the sidewalk, I felt the bullet hit the back of my head. 911, where is your emergency? Oh, 911, there was a shooting at Safeway. Where uh, Gabrielle Giffords was. Was somebody shot then, sir? Yes, the guy, it looked like the guy had a semi-automatic pistol. And he went in, he just started firing. And was, is anybody injured? Did you say Gabrielle Giffords was hit? Um, He's hit. Okay. He's breathing. Okay, and there's other people that are injured? Other people. There's multiple people shot. Okay. Oh, my God. 20584. The call came out, and we heard the audible tones saying that there was a serious incident that was going on. And what I was told next was there was a shooting at the Safeway. He was reporting a shooting him out with a semi-automatic weapon. He shot at people, and he was last seen headed towards the Walgreens. He ran northbound out of the store wearing a black hoodie and blue jeans. And uh, we have a caller who believes that Gabrielle Giffords was shot. That's uh, multiple victims. There was lights and sirens the entire way. 
In just 17 seconds, the shopping mall had been transformed into a scene of bloody carnage. I couldn't accept, even then, even as I'm walking out, that there was actually somebody out there shooting. In the immediate aftermath, the ruthless spree became a global news story. We continue our team coverage on the mass shooting at a North Side Safeway. Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords was among those shot. The gunman had injured 13 people and brutally murdered six. Oh my God, there are dead people outside that door, right in your grocery store. And the world waited to hear who was responsible for the unprecedented and ferocious rampage. We will have some more information on the person in custody connected to these shootings. The Associated Press has identified the person, the suspected shooter, as 22-year-old Jared Loeffner. But what had driven the young man from a peaceful Tucson suburb to turn his gun on his fellow residents and commit such a frenzied killing spree? Ten ten a.m., Saturday the 8th of January, 2011. Tucson, Arizona has just been rocked by the actions of one young man, 22-year-old Jared Lee Loeffner. All of a sudden, I heard a bang. They've shot the congresswoman. They've shot the congresswoman. In a killing spree lasting just 17 seconds, Loeffner had managed to end the lives of six people and wounded 13 more, including the critical shooting of Gabrielle Giffords. The congresswoman appeared to have been his main target. Known to be one of the oldest cities in the United States, Tucson, Arizona is located just 60 miles from the Mexico border. The culture is very influenced by the Mexican population. So we have a lot of uh, the Hispanic culture here. You'll have a lot of great Mexican food. Um, you'll see a lot of the Spanish dancing and in the music. It's beautiful, it's sunny. People have no idea when they hear about Tucson, Arizona, and think that it's just a big desert wasteland. And they come here and see the beautiful mountains and our fabulous weather. Despite its recent growth, the city is still renowned as a friendly, welcoming place. And we have a very small town feel, even though there's probably about 800,000 people that live in the community. Definitely just a nice, chill place. Um, great place to raise a family. You know, I love that growing up just because I, you know, I felt safe. One young resident's early years in Tucson began no differently to anyone else. Born on the 10th of September, 1988, Jared Lee Loeffner was raised an only child in a working class area of the city. His mother was a respected and well-liked manager for the Parks and Recreation Department of Pima County, and his father stayed at home, restoring cars for money. Growing up in Tucson, it's nice just because it's, uh, it's very quiet. You, know, you get to the suburbs, and it's just a nice, calm place. Um, people, they're still friendly, though. There's always something to do. There's never a boring time. During his early years, Loeffner enjoyed a close-knit circle of friends. I met Jared uh, through a mutual friend. We were in middle school, we were about like 12, 13 at the time, and uh, the common bond we had was music. You know, at that time, I had just learned how to play the guitar, and so I was just like, I need to start a band, I need to go do something, and uh, a mutual friend was just like, hey, yeah, Jared, he plays bass, like, go, go talk to Jared. The, the first time I met Jared, um, I believe it was at a party, and because um, we kind of all had the same friends. Although he demonstrated a rebellious streak in his early teenage years, Loeffner was far from a concern to either his parents or those around him. I think we were with Jared. Um, we were in my neighborhood and we're going up and down the streets and we're, we're getting out and smashing all the mailboxes on the street. Pretty much just getting into a lot of trouble, drink, go, you know, wreak havoc on neighborhoods, kind of stuff like that. Despite some episodes of delinquency, 
his friends didn't consider him unusual amongst his peers. He was on the same page as everyone else. You know, his conversations, everything he was doing seemed absolutely normal. But as Jared Loughner reached his late teens, the friendly, relaxed musician that everyone liked began to change for the worse. It seems that a big, big turning point in his life was he had a crush on a classmate in high school. According to the gal, he had a much, much bigger crush on her than she ever had on him. So she just gave him the door, you know, they broke up. And according to his uh, high school male peers, that was when the guy just really kind of began to lose it. I think he just really wanted to have friends and a girlfriend and stuff like that. And I think that that never worked out for him. So I think he felt kind of alone. He started uh, acting out in a way that, in retrospect, looks like the early uh, part of an onset of mental illness. He withdrew from school. He withdrew from friends. As an increasingly isolated teenager, Lofner eventually dropped out of high school in 2006. His slow retreat into a private world went relatively unnoticed. But five years later, he would grab the nation's attention with a vengeance. 29 minutes past midnight, the 8th of January, 2011, Motel 6, Tucson. 10 hours before embarking on his killing spree, Jared Lofner checked into room 411. Throughout the night, Lofner carried out a series of movements that saw him putting into place the final preparations for an assassination attempt on Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. Before the spree, Lofner was clearly very busy. He was no doubt suffering from what we would often call future foreshortening. He wasn't looking much beyond the next 24 hours. In fact, he may not have believed he would survive the next 24 hours. As the night progressed, Lofner made several short trips to a local convenience store. At 1 a.m., he picked up a roll of newly developed film containing photos he'd taken of himself only hours earlier. There were several pictures of, of Jared Lofner, uh, one of him in female underwear. It was kind of odd. And, and there was a photograph of a 9mm gun on top of a, uh, a, a US textbook. Lofner made the final return to his room at 4.12 a.m. with his newly developed photographs. He logged on and entered into his familiar subversive world within the internet and began posting the bizarre images online. He spent into the wee hours on the computer, uh, sending emails out and, uh, you know, goodbye, dear friends, you know, stuff like that. Retreating into the online world was nothing new. In recent months, Lofner had been pushing away friends and family in the real world in favor of a community online where he hoped his increasingly irrational views would find a home. A lot of his MySpace records showed that he was into revolutionary literature such as Fahrenheit 351 as well as Mein Kampf. So he, he was well read in a, in a typical standard teenage way. One particular site was a gathering place for conspiracy theorists and skeptics, and here Lofner hoped his odd views would find recognition. He would often post long rambling comments, often about currency, about the constitution of America, how high schools were an illegal act, and how gold and silver were the only true currency to believe in. Lofner's views began falling on deaf ears, some onliners even going so far as to suggest he seek psychological help. A lot of his fellow students and professors became really spooked, very freaked out by the guy's very, very bizarre behavior. He seemed kind of irrational, very irritated, almost demanding certain things, just, just not calm anymore, almost, you know, just the total opposite. 
Uh, he was changed big time. He had a very, very bizarre temper. And I think he was starting to do drugs with uh, the guys who's hanging out with at that time. He didn't really seem, you know, always to be like happy-go-lucky or anything. He seemed like he kind of had like a, a dark side to him or maybe a sadness. While he was at Pima Community College, there were a couple of instances when issues as, um, as difficult to talk about as abortion or war would come up. And at the most unideal times, he would blurt out in laughter. One of his female classmates was talking about her very, very uh, traumatic experience uh, having an abortion. And Lana came up with this uh, remark like, oh my God, you're a baby killer. And of course, people in the classroom would, would take exception to that and then would ask him what his problem was. What are you doing? Are you trying to make a mockery of what we're saying? And he would just always respond in kind by laughing and just saying, you're all idiots, you're all illiterate. You don't know anything that's going on here. Uh, some of the students were very, very spooked by his behavior. In fact, uh, one of the gals who was in her 50s and she had been a mental health technician, she took a seat by the door and she emailed one of her friends saying, you know, I just have a strong guts feeling that someday this guy's going to come into class with a gun and start shooting, but I just want you to know I'll be the first one out the door. We're examining the torture of students. The final straw for college authorities came when Lofner posted a disturbing video online. This is my genocide school, <laughs> where I'm going to be homeless because of the school. The Pima Community College police discovered a video he had made. He took a, a handheld camera and he walked around the campus of the Pima Community College and he basically talked about it being the biggest waste of money in American education. This is Pima Community College, one of the biggest scams in America. We're like, this is from Jared? Like, what? Like, this, this is creepy. It's just, it did not seem like anything, it didn't seem like any of his interests that he was previously aligned with. Here's the best part, the bookstore, the bookstore, the bookstore, the bookstore. It is so illegal to sell this book under the Constitution. We are also centered by our freedom of speech. It was a rambling, psychotic video that uh, set off alarm bells in uh, the Pima Community College uh, Police Department. If the student is unable to locate the external universe, then the student is unable to locate the internal universe. Where is all my subjects? I could say something sound right now, but I don't feel like it. Finally, the authorities at Pima College had a meeting with uh, Lauder and his parents and said, you know, enough is enough. Uh, we're kicking you out of college. <laughs> They gave him a letter. They said um, that he was suspended from school and that he could not come back until he had a mental health evaluation and, and an, uh, an okay from a mental health professional, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. He was never able to produce that letter, of course. Thank you. This is Jared from Pima College. 7.04 a.m the 8th of January, 2011. Just three hours before Lofner embarked on his killing spree, he again left his motel room and made yet another trip to a store. This time, he tried to buy ammunition for a recently purchased handgun. He had attempted to purchase 9mm ammunition. However, his behavior was so erratic that the sales clerk denied him, um, actually told him, I'll, I'll go check the back to see if I can find any extra ammunition. The clerk was, hey, something, something wrong with this guy. Came back and lied to, to Jared Lofner, telling him he had no ammunition to sell. The gun Lofner was trying to buy ammunition for was a high-capacity semi-automatic, legally purchased by himself only a few weeks earlier. He also developed uh, an interest in firearms, which isn't that unusual but did concern some of his friends when uh, he showed up with a gun here or there. 
Some friends had some concerns about him owning a gun. At 7.31 a.m., undeterred, Lofner again attempted to purchase ammunition from a different store. This time, failing to raise any suspicions, he succeeded in buying eight boxes, containing a total of 400 rounds. He already had uh, his weaponry. He had the uh, Glock uh, semi-automatic uh, with several, several magazines, which nobody needs, you know, unless you're in military combat. With only hours to go before the arrival of his main target, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, Lofner was on the move once again. This time, he was making his way home. As Lofner approached the front door of his house, he was confronted by his father. His father said, what the hell are you doing here with this uh, big uh, bag there? Where are you going? In recent months, the relationship between Lofner and his parents had become increasingly strained. His parents had actually disabled his vehicle and at one point taken away his shotgun uh, just because they feared that Jared might be doing something or might consider doing something uh, that wouldn't be safe for him or, or, or anyone else. Both Randy and Amy Lofner were clearly concerned about their son's behavior. Um, they s tried to talk to him, and they just couldn't make any headway. But that, too, speaks volumes. It, it's, it speaks to his parents being concerned just about Jared's state of mind. They had no idea what he was about to embark upon, but they knew that their son was, uh, was battling something, and he was, he was certainly confused, to say the very least. Outside the front of the home, a standoff between father and son continued. Well, his dad was evidently very spooked to the point where he prohibited him to go back and use the car. Grabbing a black bag from the boot of the car, Lofner turned and fled from his home. The guy ran several blocks away, calls for a cab on his cell, so a cab comes down to pick him up. In just a matter of minutes, Lofner would embark on a killing spree that would shock the nation to its core. At around 10.10 a.m. on Saturday, the 8th of January, 2011, one of America's oldest cities was devastated by a brutal killing spree carried out by 22-year-old Jared Lee Lofner. Just one hour earlier, Tucson, Arizona, and the sun-drenched morning appeared to be as any other for the local residents. It was a beautiful Saturday morning, early January. It's a time, time of year that people who live in southern Arizona cherish because it's usually 70 degrees or so, it's sunny. Uh, it's a beautiful day to be outside. It was an absolutely normal day for me. It was a relaxed Saturday. I didn't have to work. I was gonna do some grocery shopping, go visit my mother. Sunny, warm, uh, just a glorious day. And my husband and I went out on a walk. I had woken up fairly early that day, was just you know cleaning, doing various things, and I had gone to the gym. January 8th uh, was a day off for me, it was a Saturday, and I was at home with my family and enjoying the time that I had to be with my wife and my daughters. For these residents, their lives were about to become unintentionally entwined with the arrival of Senator Gabrielle Giffords. What was supposed to be happening at the Safeway that day was what's called a Congress on Your Corner, and it's a program that uh, Congresswoman Giffords had installed in which she would meet on occasion with her constituents. There were telephone calls made out to the constituents uh, the previous day informing them of the, of the event, and it was just an opportunity for her to interact with, with the people of Tucson and get a, a feel for what uh, some of the items or, or some of the political issues they had on their mind. I got a robocall from Gabby Giffords saying that she was going to have a Congress on Your Corner event Saturday, January 8th, and I went to thank her for her hard work that she does for us. Unbeknownst to Gabrielle Giffords and her team, what was supposed to be a very low-key, relaxed gathering had in fact a very real and present threat attached. 
Jared Lee Loeffner had a burning hatred for the congresswoman that could be traced back to an incident years previously. Loeffner had actually met Gabrielle Giffords at a rally similar to the one where he committed his spree. He had actually been to a prior talk that our congresswoman gave, and uh, he raised his hand, he had a question. And he basically asked, quote, what is government if words don't have meaning? Congressman Giffords obviously didn't really know how to answer that question because it's, it's sort of without any context, how would you answer that? This was something he used to always say, words have no meaning. And she was kind of like, you know, nonplussed by that, said, well, thank you, and let's move on to the next question. He took that slight very personally, and it's something that grew in him uh, over the months and, and years that followed. And it, it became not only a curiosity, uh, but it, it became a, a very directed hatred toward Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. A later exchange would compound the hatred he felt towards her. He also wrote to her office, and her office wrote back to him, but they made the mistake of addressing the letter to a Mr. Lofney rather than Lofner, and this angered him and proved that he was clearly intellectually superior to the people who were in power. So he had no respect for politicians, state, teachers, or authority. This kind of killing spree is not political. It comes out of psychopathology, not politics. And Jared Lofner would have opened fire under these circumstances, even if he had never met Congressman Giffords. At 9.54 a.m., Lofner arrived by taxi outside the Safeway store. Lots of small behavioral clues from Lofner's behavior before the spree show that he was completely lucid and coherent. He took a taxi to the supermarket where Giffords was speaking. He had the money on him to pay. He gave a bill to the taxi driver and insisted on the change. So he clearly knew what he was doing and where he was. Just yards away, Lofner's intended target was about to greet those who had been queuing to meet her. When I went down there that day, I pulled into the parking lot and I could see the big sign up there that said Gabby Giffords. And so I parked the car and walked up there. Now there was probably 25 people in line. There was a number of elderly women and men, it appeared to be couples, some not. There was a woman just slightly older than me with a little girl with her. And when I got about six feet from Gabby, one of her aides, Gabe Zimmerman, who I'd never met before, came out and talked to me and told me I'd have to get to the end of the line and sign in. Gabrielle Giffords is there just about ready to start her Congress on the corner. And I turned to my husband, I said, you know, you're lucky that I'm not more political or I would make you stop right now while I shake her hand. And he's like, come on, let's get inside and get, get the Brussels sprouts and the milk and get out of here before it gets too crowded. So we are walking in the shooter is walking out at the exact same time. At 10.10 10 a.m., Lofner's killing spree began. All of a sudden, this uh, crazed guy comes charging, barging his way through this line, way, way up to the front, takes out this uh, pistol and bang! He opened fire, shooting Gabrielle Giffords directly in the head. Gabe Zimmerman, who was one of uh, Gabrielle Gifford's leading aides, he immediately ran up to her aid, and he took a bullet in his head, which immediately killed him. Within seconds of us walking into the store, that the pop started. I knew immediately it was a gun. I was standing there talking to this couple, and all of a sudden I heard a bang. I had no idea what that was. I'd never heard a gun fire before. And it wasn't until people started running into the Safeway, screaming, they've shot the Congresswoman, they've shot the Congresswoman, that my brain woke up and went, 
oh my gosh. I saw him just as a figure walking, as a, as a shadow. Turning to his left, facing the queuing line of now shocked attendees, he rapidly opened fire again. He pulled the gun up and he aimed it right at my head, and then he brought this hand up to grab the gun. If I ran to the north or ran to the west, I might make myself a target. So I laid down on the sidewalk, hoping that he would not notice me. When he brought this hand up to grab the gun, I dropped to the sidewalk. And when I dropped to the sidewalk, I felt the bullet hit the back of my head. And I went right on down and laid on the sidewalk. As the frenzied attack continued, Lofner turned his gun on the then district director, Ron Barber. Another attendee, Judge John Roll, leapt in between the two in a moment of sheer bravery. Uh, John Roll pushed him on the table, jumped on top of him, and took a fatal, fatal wound in the back. I walked out, and the first body that I came to was Judge John Roll. I couldn't tell where he was shot. And I kept asking, there were a few people crawling around, where is he shot, where is he shot? I just started doing CPR. It was futile, I, I mean, he was just gone. He saved Ron Barber's life, but uh, lost his. After emptying his first magazine, Lofner attempted to reload his gun to continue his spree. In the seconds that followed, a bystander seized the opportunity and picked up the nearest chair, hitting Lofner across the back. And when this person t tried to hit him with the folding chair, his left arm flew out and that gave me a chance to grab his wrist. And I grabbed his left wrist just like this <clears throat> and stuck my foot in front of his feet and hit him just as hard as I could with my right hand. During the struggle that followed, Lofner fell to the ground. I hear, get the gun, get the magazine. And I knelt up, and as I knelt up, I'm right at the small of the back of the shooter. I took my hand and I grabbed that I, I had his left wrist with, and I slid it right up to his throat like that. Lofner again attempted to grab another fully loaded magazine out of his back pocket. And in his haste, he dropped the magazine, and I was able to grab it before he could pick it up. And I told him if he moved, I'd choke him. And he went to roll a little, and I choked him. And he went, ow, 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 ow. In the heat of the moment, with Lofner subdued, one of the victims grabbed his gun. Another man actually took Lofner's gun and pointed it at him and uh, threatened to shoot him. And Bill Badger said, put the gun down and step on it right now. Put it on the ground and step on it. And, and so he did. With Lofner unable to escape, police raced to the scene. Requesting additional units. Shall I ask the other frequencies? There are multiple victims. We need a lot more units here. And fire is sending uh, everything they have. As I was heading there, the dispatchers were giving us more information. When the initial call came out and I heard those audible tones, there were the only information I was given was that there was a shooting. And as I was responding, was when the updated information was given. Customers have tackled the suspect. They are holding him down at the Safeway. With the gunman restrained, he was soon in police custody, and news of his identity began to filter out. One of my close girlfriends, she calls me, and I, you know, I answer and at this time, and I'm like, where are you, what's going on? She's like, I'm at Safeway. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, are you all right? She's like, I don't know what happened. Um, she's like, but it was weird. She's like, I saw this young kid, and he looked familiar, and he had a gun, just point blank shooting people. I remember getting out of the gym, and my phone, I had like, 20 missed calls, all these different, you know, text messages. Have you heard? Have you heard? It's Jared. And I was like, was he shot? Like, like you know, like, I know there's going to be fatalities. Like, was he one of them? She's like, no, dude. Like, he was a person who shot everyone. And I was just beyond shock. But what drove this lifelong resident of Tucson to commit such a devastating rampage? A ruthless spree 
that shook his local community to the core. At around 10.10 a.m. on the 8th of January 2011, Jared Lofner committed a deadly killing spree in Tucson, Arizona. In just 17 seconds, he emptied a 33-round magazine of its bullets into a waiting crowd. The ruthless attack would ultimately leave six dead and 13 wounded. Customers have tackled the suspect. They are holding him down at the Safeway. In an act of heroism, bystanders subdued the shooter, ending the killing spree as quickly as it had begun. It was just an eerie scene of people dead, taking their last breaths. There was some uh, cries of panic, nothing loud, and, um, and then nothing. Five minutes after the last bullet was fired, police arrived on the scene, where Lofner was immediately placed in handcuffs and removed from the devastating aftermath of his killing spree. The first thing he said to law enforcement is, I want everyone to know that there was no one else involved. He wanted everyone to know that this was him and him alone. With Lofner safely in custody, people began to take stock of themselves and those around them. Jared Lofner at this time was in the back of the car uh, of one of the police cars. Um, to be honest, I didn't pay him any mind at that point because we needed to render aid to the victims. There wasn't that mass chaos, a mass of people running like you would almost expect. It's almost like they came together and began to help each other. I had my blinders on and I was, I was taking care of the people that were right here. I'm laying there, my glasses are broken, I grabbed my cell phone out of my pocket and I clipped my number here at the house and Sally answered the phone and I said, Sally, I've been shot, but I'm okay, but I need you here right away. I mean, I actually said to him, what do you mean? I thought maybe there'd been a robbery. I simply didn't know. He told me where he was and when I got off the phone, I immediately forgot. I was just absolutely in shock. A nine-year-old child was also amongst the victims that morning. Well, the, the one memory that I don't think I will ever be able to purge from my brain is looking over and seeing one-handed CPR being done on a tiny little nine-year-old girl. I realized how desperate it was when Somebody came up to me and said, there's a little girl. And it doesn't look like she's going to make it. Tragically, on the way to hospital, she died. Amongst those critically wounded was Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords with a serious gunshot wound to the head. Jared Lofner's bloody rampage had left 13 people seriously wounded and six dead. Bill did what he did by knocking this man to the ground and holding him there was of absolutely no surprise to me whatsoever because that's Bill's character. That's, that's how Bill's made. Along with the young child, five adults were also victims of the brutal spree Dorothy Morris, Judge John Roll, Phyllis Sheck, Dorwin Stoddard and Gabe Zimmerman all lost their lives at the hands of one man, Jared Lee Lofner. The 9th of March, 2011, Arizona Superior Court. Jared Lee Lofner was initially charged on 49 counts. If he was found guilty, he would face the death sentence. At his first court hearing in May um, 2011, he had an outburst. 
he was, he was uh, uh, disconnected from what was going on. I think Jared Loeffner was a, a very confused young man who was spiraling into to madness. Throughout the proceedings, Loeffner's behavior deteriorated and he had to be forcibly removed from court. Deemed unfit to stand trial, he was remanded in custody where his mental health declined further. He was in just terrible shape. He was psychotic, he was having hallucinations. At one point he paced for 50 hours in his cell, got open literally for 50 hours straight. He got open sores on his feet, those became infected. 26th of June, 2011. Diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, the trial judge ruled that Lofner should be forcibly medicated with antipsychotics. There's, there is a possibility that Lofner believed he was killing evil people. Uh, he was doing us a big favor, ridding the world of evil. And this was just a, an act that he knew he had to fulfill because these were very bad forces working on our society, and he was doing us a favor. After 14 months, he was deemed competent to stand trial, where the prosecution was seeking the death penalty. I think he and his representation saw the writing on the wall. He would have been executed. In an eventual plea bargain, Lofner admitted guilt to 19 of the 49 original charges, including attempted assassination of a congresswoman, the murder of two federal employees, causing the death of four others, attempted murder of two federal employees, and injuring 10 others through the use of a pistol. The shooting really shook this town. People reacted with grief, mourning, just utter shock. I've always known that I was gonna see things that most people don't see, but never to the magnitude of this incident. We survived, so we try to be a voice for the people who will no longer have a voice. By admitting his guilt, Lofner avoided the death penalty. That day will be forever emblazoned on my mind and in my heart and on my soul as the very worst day of my life. Jared Lee Lofner was given seven consecutive life terms plus 140 years, meaning under current law, he will never be released. Now this guy has got to spend the rest of his life living with the consequences of what he did. Since the shooting spree, mental health and gun control laws have again become the focus of fierce debate throughout America. I think for our people who have mental problems, we need to help them. We can't just push them out there and let them do something like this. It kind of drew a line in of who do you really know? You say you know someone, but do you really know them? You were not going to find the red flags in his childhood. And that's because he had a genetically determined illness, schizophrenia, uh, that doesn't appear in terms of symptoms until an individual is in his late teens or early 20s. You get a different Jared Loeffner at that point. And this one turned out to be extremely violent. 